uh, process. Way was the man who established the concept of the circulation and brought hemodynamics into picture. And Richard Lover was the man who said there are various manifestations of heart failure. And Raymond Wiesens, who was the French anatomist, described the complete picture of heart failure with edema feet in a patient of mitral stenosis. We all know diabetes is a very complex disease. And as seen by this Venn diagram, that you have heart failure, chronic kidney disease, type 2 diabetes, and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease are all intertwined. And you can see by this Venn diagram. So 12 to 45% of the patients of heart failure have diabetes. 16% of the population of patients have heart diabetes. And we have 35 to 45% of the patient with heart failure have chronic kidney disease. So it's all intertwined and linked with each other. And if you look at the physiology of heart, we have 50 to 100 ml is the stroke volume, and 60 to 90 beats per minute is the heart rate. That gives you about three to nine liters per minute is the cardiac output. And this can increase up to 20 liters in people who run, who have shivering or overheating, stress, sleep, infection, and so on and so forth. And this is generated for presence of diabetes itself, the risk of heart failure is very high. And this is the understanding of the heart failure in a patient with diabetes who left in patient with a type 2 or type 1 diabetic with the hypertension, cardiomyopathy, and the nephroneuropathy, and coronary artery disease and a microvascular disease. The risk of symptomatic heart failure is pretty high. On the right, you see patients of type 1 diabetes who have an increased blood, sub blood sugar, and that itself causes the disturbances into the muscle activity, and that muscle myosin is exposed to T cells, which presents as a dysregulation of the immune system, presenting as the hyperemic response, and therefore damaging the muscles, and having the autoimmune background to the manifestation of heart failure. And therefore, when you look at patients of heart failure in diabetes patients, we have the sex, for example, if you look at the preserved heart failure, which is very common in a female patient, with reduced heart failure, reduced action fraction heart failure, common in male patients with a diabetic nephropathy and a coronary artery disease and hypertension, ultimately results into cardiac failure. They can see the picture on the top, the increasing the dimension of the left ventricle. And what is very interesting, those patients who have heart failure also have a decreased pancreatic dysfunction and having the insulin resistance and therefore causing what is called the cardiogenic diabetes. So therefore they feed each other. The heart failure feeds the diabetes and diabetes feeds the heart failure. And therefore, this was a presentation in European Heart Journal and what it shows that the insulin resistance causes hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia causes heart failure, and, hyper, and heart failure causes insulin resistance. And what is the proof for this? They use the left ventricular access device and they reduce the patients of heart failure, they reduce insulin resistance, and they reduce hyperglycemia, telling us thereby that these three are interconnected with each other, they are inseparable from each other. So therefore, uh, what was seen that diabetes and heart failure are the two sides of the same coin because both of them have sympathetic nervous system activity. They have increased renin angiotensin system activation and they also have increased neprolysin. And what is interesting that these two are the drivers of the microvascular complications and a heart failure progression. We always been taught that it is the hyperglycemia which drives the microvascular complication, but it is the sympathetic stimulation which is the driver of the microvascular complication. And therefore, the heart failure and diabetes are both characterized by the increased distending pressure in the left ventricle and in the glomerulus. And you see the treatment of them, both of them, is also similar. For example, ACE inhibitors are used for both. The angiotensin sector blockers are used for both. The MRA can be used for both, and so is nephrolysin inhibitors. So therefore, they share a common soil, and therefore, they have a common presentation. And how this is possible? This is possible because the heart has a transporter called and they have cardiomyopathy. So therefore, it is the stimulation of sodium hydrogen exchanger which is responsible for these microvascular complications rather than the hyperglycemia that has been taught to us in the medical school. And what is interesting is that cardiac, cardiomyocyte does not have SGLT2 receptors. We all have beneficial effects on cardiac failure with using SGLT2, 
but interestingly, there's no receptor. How does it work? It works on sodium hydrogen exchanger. In fact, there's a docking site for HGLT2 on NHE1, and that makes it act on the myocardium, and they forget all beneficial effects of the heart failure with HGLT2 use because of the action on this particular transporter. So we have this association between diabetes and heart failure, which is a metabolic in origin. We know there's increased free fatty acid, which causes sympathetic stimulation, which causes sodium absorption because of insulin resistance, and that causes hypertension, which is a risk factor for heart failure. And also, the increased free fatty acid causes deposition of what is called epicardial fat. And this epicardial fat is causing inflammation in the myocardium by producing the microvascular abnormality and ever producing heart failure in these patients. What is the most important part of the entire metabolic understanding is what is called the metabolic flexibility of the myocardium. What you see here in this picture, that heart uses the fatty acid, glucose, branched amino acids, and ketone as a nutrient. But in patients of heart failure and diabetes, there's a high amount of free fatty acid I mentioned already. And a free fatty acid is a dirty fuel. It doesn't give that much of ATP as you expect to. You get only two ATPs molecules with one atom of oxygen when you use free fatty acid. You get three ATPs when you use oxygen. You get three ATPs when you use ketone bodies. So therefore, this is a dirty fuel. And when you have excess utilization of fatty acid, it causes accumulation of ceramide, which causes inflammation and therefore fibrosis and therefore heart failure. So this is the reason of metabolic flexibility, which is causing heart problems. We all know about heart failure of patients with preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction. And you see in patients who have obesity, which is the main driver for the preserved ejection fraction, is because of the systemic inflammation. And there's an excess amount of advanced glycogen products and also hyperinsulinemia, which brings about hypertrophy of the myocardium and if we get preserved ejection fraction. As opposed to that, in patients with reduced ejection fraction, we have the excess amount of AGEs, and also there's a lipotoxicity, which is a component in patients with reduced ejection fraction, and for these patients have an increased amount of fibrosis produced by the fibroblast, and therefore they have a dilatation of the myocardium. So, so goes the heart, and so goes the kidney. And in the initial part, when you have a nepralysin activity is better, then you have a diuresis, and therefore the patient can overcome the crisis. But when it becomes chronic disease or chronic heart failure, there is a more sympathetic stimulation that brings about retention of renin and that brings about excess angiotensin too, and that causes increased blood pressure and therefore heart failure is more. We all know that the, erith the erythropoietin is produced by the kidney and is destroyed in patients of diabetes. Why so? Because it's produced in the proximal tubule by a specialized cell called fibroblast. And when you have excess of glucose coming in the proximal tubule because overactivity of HGLT2, what happens is destroy these fibroblasts and therefore erythropoietin production goes down. And when you give HGLT2, it blocks the HGLT2 transporter and therefore the glucose is no more absorbed and there's no oxidative stress and therefore these patients improve their hemoglobin. So eventually, whether you think patients of diabetes, obesity, and chronic heart failure, what is the problem? The problem is when you have hyperinsulinemia, adipose tissue expansion, accumulation of glucose and lipid intermediate products. And this causes suppression of autophagy, oxidative stress, and therefore decreased function of the tissue. And therefore, there's upregulation of AKT and mTORC1, and downregulation of 31, PGC1 alpha, and FG121. And this is the reason why you get heart failure in patients with diabetes. So therefore, if you summarize what I said so far, that diabetes causes inflammation, dyslipidemia, and chronic artery and coronary artery disease, which causes, again, diabetic cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And we have stimulation of RAS activation, improper calcium handling, and autonomic dysfunction, which ultimately results into diabetic cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Atrial fibrillator begets heart failure, and heart failure begets atrial fibrillation. We know that there's a complex association between these two, and it's again very common in patients of diabetes. Sleep apnea also increases the heart failure, both preserved and a reduced ejection fraction. You can see that 50 to 80, 50, 40% of the patient have the heart failure in patients who have the AHA score of more than 15, suggesting that these two can coexist together. <laughs>
There are many drugs that we use in patients of diabetes, which can also cause heart failure. For example, the drug like DPP I mentioned, and insulin, TZDs, can cause heart failure, but drugs like SGLT2 improve the heart failure. So therefore, knowledge of the drugs that the patient is taking is also very important. So in general, the diabetes, heart failure, and renal dysfunction is a vicious circle. They all together, they move together, and they act together. And hyper, hyper, hy, 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 heart failure is a progressive disease with a poor outcome. You can see in those life study and the renal study, the death rate is almost sixfold compared to people without heart failure. And this is the classification which is given in what we discussed, the next speakers are going to discuss more on this. And this is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction, widely reduced, and the improved heart failure, which are described based on the echocardiography. And to end my talk, the final words, this is from uh, Milton Patrick, Milton Packer, who wrote in Diabetes Care that there's a strong bi-directional association between diabetes and heart failure. Heart failure is the most important, most preventable, and treatable cardiovascular complication of diabetes. A number of pathological mechanisms like hypertension, chronic uh, kidney disease, coronary artery disease, and immune dysregulation do an important role, and use of glucose-lowering agents can influence the evolution and the progression of heart failure, both either favorably, unfavorably, years before their effects on a microvascular events. I want to emphasize this, years before, their effects on the microvascular events, possibly the reactions on their common mechanisms. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much for the patient listening. <laughs>